Good afternoon. I have the great pleasure to start a um, dialogue with one of the chief executives, probably most in the news last year, and also uh, Dr. Willow, you made, you made today a very uh, groundbreaking announcement. We will certainly come back. But uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Albert Burla, who is since 2019, just before uh, the COVID crisis broke out, you were nominated chairman and uh, CEO of uh, Pfizer. And what formidable journey uh, in the last uh, uh, 30 months. And um, uh, you certainly have made a major contribution that many of us uh, became resistant against uh, the virus. So thank you on behalf of everybody. And I, th I think what is remarkable um, is the fact that you went into this um, uh, direction or venture uh, without asking for public help, as far as I know. Uh, we, because uh, you could have probably had access to billions of dollars, uh, but you did it yourself, you did it alone, together with your partner, also BioNTech. Now, I just have said uh, that you made a major announcement, a groundbreaking announcement this morning. Can you tell it us a little bit more? First of all, thank you for the honor, Chairman, to be here with you. Uh, today we announced that um, uh, we will offer all our patent protected medicines, all vaccines or medicines that currently exist in the US or in Europe to the 45 poorest countries of the world. It is a population of 1.2 billion people at cost. And we also make the commitment that every year as we discover and bring to the US or to the, uh, Europe or to the world new medicines, automatically those new medicines will be inserted into uh, the offer of the portfolio that we will offer into these countries. I think that uh, it's really a fulfillment of a dream that we had together with my leadership team when we started in 19. Uh, the first week we met in January of 19 mm -hmm. in California and to set up the goals for the next five years. And one of them was by 2023, we will reduce the number of people in the world that cannot afford our medicines by 50%. I think today this dream is becoming a reality. So it's really a purpose-driven uh, company. And if you say at cost without margin, or certainly you must add a certain margin for research and uh, development. We will not. We define at cost strictly what it takes to manufacture it and very minimal shipment. We exclude all the research money that took to invent the medicines, or the legal that took to make the contracts, uh, or everything, or the administrative cost, everything that it is uh, sometimes is added to the nonprofit will not be added in that case. It's going to be strictly the cost to make and ship. If I, if I think of all the discussions during the last year related to uh, COVID medicine, I, I think this is such a breakthrough. And um, if we see how many uh, people uh, in the developing world, and uh, here I immediately come in with a question, when we talk about uh, the developing world, whom do you help? I mean, are all countries included? Or? Yeah. We uh, use the principle. So we are including all the low income countries, according to the World Bank definition, there are 27. But because there is always a gray line between the income of countries that they are not anymore because they improved a little bit, but still they cannot afford, we decided that every country that used to be low income, but they graduated to higher level, the last 10 years will also be included. That gives us 45 countries, which are 1.2 billion of population. 1.2 billion people. Yes. And would you help those countries uh, also afterwards to develop their own production line? What we are going to do, and this is a very good point, that um, 
what we discovered through uh, the pandemic was that uh, supply was not enough to resolve the issues that these countries are having. Right now, for example, there are billions of doses of our vaccine, the vaccine that was used in Europe, in, uh, in the US, that it is offered to low-income countries for free. And it is offered by the US government mainly, but also by the European Union, that they are doing donations. So the US government bought for us at cost and they donate it. They can't use them right now. Because we discovered that one thing is supply and the other thing is to have educated population that believe that vaccines is doing well, to have doctors or nurses that will administer, to have infrastructure and logistical that you can store it in every place in the country and not only in the capital of the country. A lot of things are missing. For this reason, given the lessons that we got, in addition to the initiative that is brought and addresses 45 countries, we selected five of them that uh, the governments are really keen to work on these issues as well. Those five, it is Rwanda, uh, Malawi, Uganda, uh, Ghana, Ghana and uh, Senegal. So with those five, we signed already uh, our letters of intent and we will work not only giving them the medicines, but on the ground to identify blockages yeah. between the medicine arrives in the country and the medicines is used by a patient. Is it that, for example, we have now breast cancer medicines. They are very expensive medicines. There are women in Africa that they have breast cancer. They're not diagnosed all. And one thing is to say, we don't invest in diagnosing breast cancer because we don't have the medicine anyway. Now you will have the medicine, but you need both. Yeah. So we will send uh, also experts from our side. We have a program that uh, we call Global Fellows. So everyone in Pfizer can raise their hand and say, I volunteer. I want to go to work with the NGO for six months, for nine months. And uh, we guarantee his position when he goes back. We keep providing the salary and we provide also cost accommodations. And we network with these organizations. Physicians can go, doctors, engineers can go to help with this country. So we will do all of that so to make sure that it's not only we wash our hands, we send your medicines, we care to make an impact, we care to make a difference. So you are becoming really a global health provider. And... Unfortunately, I, I wish to, to, to be able to do that. I don't think I will be able to do it alone. So that's why yeah. I'm calling everyone that uh, has something to offer in that space, the World Health Organization, the Bill Gates Foundation, the Carter Foundation, uh, other organizations, non-governmental, uh, Doctors Without Borders, that they have resources there. We would like to partner together so they can do diagnosis, we can give the medicines. Like Gavi, which... Uh, Gavi, was... for example, has made a huge difference in the world. Yeah. The, the biggest product of Gavi, the one that, according to Gavi and Bill Gates, have saved more lives, it is a pneumococcal vaccine that we are providing. See, let's say the founder was uh, Bill Gates, but it was originated here. Actually, Gavi was born here. He always says that when he speaks. He says <laughs> that was here in Davos, mate. Davos, yeah. yeah. It's a Davos child, if I may say so. Uh, and we have many children. Uh, <laughs> now, you, you referred to it already. Um, uh, how important is cooperation? I mean, um, and not only uh, you have to have cooperations with uh, other businesses, but also with governments. Um, I, I, I feel you, you have sometimes to do also with very little knowledge of the government for such matters like mm -hmm. uh, uh, complicated medicines and so on. What is the importance of co uh, cooperation? How do you approach it? I think it's very important. I think nothing would have happened during the pandemic, for example, without cooperation, but nothing would have happened uh, when Gavi was founded. Yeah. Um, and nothing would have happened in the world uh, if the stakeholders, they don't set common goals. Certainly, they need to be purpose-driven goals yeah. and uh, follow through mm. those goals. Mm. We, we saw it in all aspects. For example, AstraZeneca partnered with Academia, Oxford, to make yeah. it happen. We partner with a small biotech yeah. to make it happen. We partner with FDA or EMA to approve uh, the yeah. products. There was a lot of work that happened from many so that we will be able to reach yeah. the level that we reached. 
I have to say, as an observer, when I look uh, at your cooperation with uh, BioNTech, uh, in such a setting, uh, you feel that there must be tensions, but uh, you always really acted as twins, cooperating. Can you say something about it? Yeah, I can say. I think it is uh, the best partnership we ever had. Yeah. I think uh, the trust is what is defined, starts from the top, uh, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, but thank, thank God, we bonded immediately with Uger Sachin, who is the, the founder. And it is amazing because I'm Greek and Jew and he's Turk and Muslim. And uh, I immigrated to the US and he immigrated to Germany. So there's common paths in the two of us. Yeah. And we both, the first thing that we exchanged when we set the agreement was that it's going to be an oral agreement for the next uh, couple of months because you don't have time to sign contracts. We start the work immediately. We started the work... In January or when...? when okay. We started the work in March mm -hmm. and the main, we signed the contract after two months, which was only the research. The main contract, which was a commercial agreement yeah. to define billions, basically, of dollars, was signed in January of 21, after everything was done. All of that time, we were operating with uh, the trust of our world, which doesn't happen in corporate world. Right? Now, I, I come back to a technical question. When you produce uh, those very uh, complicated medicines about mRNA, some people say the knowledge is not actually not the intellectual property of the product, it's the production itself. Could you say something about it? Um, I think there are across the board. For example, we don't own right now for this vaccine intellectual property. It is BioNTech, right? But we developed the manufacturing process to be able uh, to do it. So all of that are things that uh, they count. In general, I think that um, the mRNA technology it is a very powerful technology. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a, a panacea. I don't think it's the holy grail. I don't think that will treat all diseases in the world. But I do think that is we have just scratched the surface of what we can see. Yeah. How much is the mRNA uh, technology protected by patents or... Uh, I think it's the holy grail. Without the protection, BioNTech would never have the money that uh, they got from their investors to develop it. Without uh, intellectual property, we would never have the money that we have because we, everything we do, we do it with other people's money. They're called the shareholders. Yeah. They can tell us, put the money in new research or give it back to us for dividends. Uh, I think the bloodline of the innovative industry, it is this concept that a property cannot be only be bricks and mortar, can also be intellectual property. Yeah. And that's exactly what is happening in technology or in high biology. It's very important. Now, that leads me exactly to the next question. What drives you, actually? Uh, is it scientific uh, curiosity? Is it, uh, I mean, you excluded already uh, uh, material, uh, let's say, reasons. Uh, what, what, drives, what drives Dr. Buller? Uh, me, me personally. Yeah, uh, personal. I like what I do. I like what we do because it's intellectually challenging but also has the additional benefit that the success brings good to the world. It's very intellectual challenging to make a perfect cell phone. And that brings satisfaction to the world and anybody should be very proud of being able to do it. But when you are helping to make a breast cancer medicine or breast, a lung cancer medicine, you are getting not only the satisfaction that you want, but the satisfaction that the impact was saving lives. Yeah. So that's something that in our industry, our people are feeling every day, yeah. is not the same with the other industries. It's to a certain extent like uh, my own uh, 800 colleagues in the forum. I mean, being driven by this feeling of improving the state of the world. It's a very big driver. Yeah. And I'm certain that uh, this, this sense, this uh, mindset was what drove people to work day and night. And I'm talking about not 30 or 40 people, I'm talking about 1,000 people in this vaccine. But because for eight months, the, four-digit number of people, they were not sleeping, literally. Which uh, uh, leads me exactly to the next question. When um, uh, 
to take on um, COVID-19, to produce your, uh, your vaccines, it must have meant a major change of the company. I mean, you had traditional successful products and now suddenly you have an overriding objective. How did you manage this? First of all, it was challenging, but um, in our being unfortunate to have COVID, that was also fortunate because it drove very different behaviors. Yeah. Let's remember that the times that we were trying to develop a solution faster than a smaller biotech, that was the challenge for Pfizer, how to move fast, because we are big, right? But these were days of darkness, with no hope in the horizon. So people were afraid that the civilization, the way we know it, will uh, is, is, could, could disappear. That was a tremendous yeah. weapon in my effort to convince everyone that we need to go about making the impossible possible, because there are a lot at stake. And then, surprise, surprise, they made the impossible possible. So the, the company was before, to a certain extent, driven by the fears that the pipelines are running out. And now suddenly you had such a full pipeline. <laughs> yes, but I have to say that there is also because of the work of my predecessor. It's not that I came yeah. and I found a company that was collapsing. I found a company the best shape one could give to another. And I built on it. Now, if um, you look uh, more to the future, um, do we have to expect prolongation of uh, the pandemic or at least the epidemic or uh, how, how would you foresee the future? Yes. Or do we have to, and I may immediately ask a second question, uh, should we be afraid of another virus and um, yeah. what does it mean how we uh, create the necessary resilience personally, nationally, mm. globally? On the first question, I don't think that the virus will disappear. Uh, we are not certain about it, but most scientists agree that the virus will be around forever. But the real question that everybody is asking is not this. It is, can we get our lives back? Can we live normal, can normal economic activity, normal social activity with the virus presence? And the answer is yes. I think we can. Absent a variant that we are not, have not foreseen right now that can happen, but it's not the most likely scenario. I think we have the means right now very effective vaccines, as the, virus, uh, as, the vari as, the, as the virus mutates, we have the ability to follow up and, pre pre let's say, update the vaccines and to have treatments. With that, people should not die anymore, yeah. even if we are not following the way that we are following the, the social measures in the past. Now, on the second question, shall we are afraid of, of a new... Uh, very different virus that would come, and we have now all these examples with uh, the monkey pox. I don't think we should be afraid, but I think we should be prepared. Yeah. And that should, even the little fear that we have, we should, that should ease it. And if we are prepared, I think science will win. Now, uh, some people may argue uh, you have now these new treatments. Um, some people may argue, why should I get vaccinated? If so, is a treatment. Well, how would you respond? Because I think the goal is not for you to get sick and then treat you. <laughs> the goal is to prevent the sickness. Yeah. And that will maximize your chances to do well, and that will maximize the chances of people that you love not to get infected. Yeah. You vaccinate not only for yourself, you vaccinate also to protect society, and particularly to protect those that you love the most, because they are the ones that you are together. What, what do you foresee, um, I mean, most of, uh, we, we, I think we set the standard, because in Switzerland, for those who do not know, there are no restrictions anymore, so we set the standard that we uh, require vaccination. Now, how many vaccinations do we need in the future? What it's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, first of all, I think we will need vaccinations in the future, but also I'm concerned that the compliance of the population yeah. with the recommendations of the experts will not be very high. More people did the first dose, and then lesser did the second, and then lesser will do the third and the fourth. And um, so for that reason, we need 
to find a solution that makes it easy for people to get. And I think this solution, it is the number one priority is to have a vaccine that lasts a year. So once people know that it is once a year, I do it every autumn, for example, fall, uh, I think that will improve the amount of people that they are getting the vaccine. And I think you there are also certain attempts to combine it with a anti-flu vaccine. That is another very good way to make it uh, uh, to, to improve compliance. If someone thinks that I'm going to go to the doctor or to the pharmacy, but at least with one shot I will get two flu and va that also will increase the number. So these are the things. It's very difficult to improve the efficacy right now. It's very very high. But what you can improve it is uh, how convenient it is and how can last the efficacy for a longer period of time. So the question which I ask now to the audience is maybe not fair, but uh, uh, despite, let's say, no restrictions in Switzerland, we insisted on being vaccinated, being tested twice, um, and uh, this may become a standard for future meetings anyway. I mean, if we are not getting uh, rid of the virus, uh, anybody who felt uh, this was uh, too much, or I, I said it's an unfair question because who will the hell? <laughs> who will the hell? Uh, but uh, I, I just can share with you: we had many internal, we had many internal uh, discussions. Now, when you, uh, Albert, when you look at uh, let's say the process to get approval. And um, usually it's a very FDA, as uh, European authority, it's a very cumbersome process. Can you tell us something? Uh, uh, do you feel uh, governments uh, understood very fast uh, your needs and uh, reacted positively to your needs? Or would you recommend for the future any, any change in public-private cooperation? Uh, if we are confronted again with such a situation. Yeah. There are a lot of good examples, great examples, and there are examples that uh, maybe we can improve uh, for future um, uh, situations. Always the intention was very good. I'm convinced about it, by all. Now, you ask about regulators. I think both EMA and FDA and most regulators, the, the UK regulators as well, I think they belong in the category that they did extremely well. I think they understood the situation and they stood, they sacrificed themselves also a lot. I know that preparing the final report, maybe 30 of our people couldn't sleep for five days and they would send and then they would go to bed. And then the next day, FDA would start, 30 FDA people would not sleep for five days to review the data. Yeah. Because usually it takes six months and now they were doing it in one week. So this was crucial for our success. We wouldn't be able to do what we did without this collaboration. Now, there are some other examples, but for example, when in countries that uh, there are multiple centers of, uh, of scientific authority, that they don't coordinate very well. And some happen also in the US, uh, sometimes between NIH and CDC and FDA was not always, let's say, the most smooth uh, collaboration. They are the first ones to recognize that this is happening, and I think they already announced that they try to find ways so that they can yeah. be better. When you get the conditional approval or preliminary approval, um, who is actually carrying the risk and uh, the liability if something is happening? I mean, if it's not working out well. Most uh, countries, they identify that. In the US and in Europe was always clearly identified, so they are taking uh, the liability, if there are lawsuits, for example, against that. So the government is taking the liability? It is. It, it was some uh, issue with... Uh, uh, the US and Europe were ready for that already, but I think most of the issues were with some uh, um, countries that were not familiar with that. Yeah. Um, we took... Um, what, what was our concern mm -hmm. with the vaccine? It's not with any other medicines. For example, now we don't ask anyone to do anything on liabilities, but with a vaccine, that we knew that there is a very fanatic group of anti-vaxxers that will go after us no matter what. They will claim that the sun didn't go up because people were vaccinated and that created issues with the crop, so I'm suing you. 
And one thing it is to sue you in the US, another thing is to sue you in a country where the legal system is not up to that standards or in Switzerland, right? So I think that's behind us. Uh, everything <laughs> went okay and now I think we can move on. I think we were, we were <laughs> both uh, targets of the anti-vaccine uh, movements and uh, conspiracy uh, people uh, claiming that I had triple I wondered what it is, tri triple um, uh, COVID. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, and I <laughs> was, uh, I think it got uh, hundreds of thousands of clicks and so on. Uh, I know you were also target. Um, I read one day, but was arrested by FBI. Yeah, same happened to me. And there are pictures, <laughs> pictures of me and FBI officers. Yeah. I don't know how. Yeah. I never said. The surprising thing it is that the same publication I found out because I uh, had published the previous one that was arrested was the Pope <laughs> by FBI. <laughs> so ridiculous. It's, yeah. <clears throat> so we are good uh, company. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least I was in good company. <laughs> yeah. But um, so you know, so it's such a success of mRNA um, um, technology. How confident can we be, or how hopeful can we be? So this technology helps also in many other diseases, cancer, particularly malaria, I think was mentioned uh, in the media. Can you lift uh, the curtain about uh, what's happening in this respect? Yes. I think we will see a lot of advancements with mRNA. And the good thing after the success of COVID it is that right now we have a substantial wave of companies, biotechs and big pharma, that are working on mRNA, a lot. And they are working on multiple applications of mRNA. Uh, so I think the first, the, the first things that I'm hopeful to see it is other vaccines other than COVID. A flu vaccine with mRNA, a single vaccine with mRNA, other vaccines with mRNA. The second wave I think that uh, we could see it is cancer. We are, uh, there is a lot of research that is happening for many years now, trying to use your immune system to attack your cancer cells to train your immune system as the vaccine is training to attack the virus and kill it, is to, to kill your uh, cancer cell. Then we are going to the third horizon, which the technology will be used for gene editing, to be able, if people are, are born, they have a genetic disease that is right now, it is untreatable and in many cases a death sentence for those. There's nothing that they can do about it. Now we have some hopes that maybe that also can work. So we will see a lot of advancements, exactly because so many people are working. We are working on that as well, on all of that, but there are also many others, so that increases the chances that something will come out. As a company so much built on research, um, you had to observe uh, the COVID restrictions yourself. So how, how did you manage, I mean, with homework, uh, to undertake such a great effort? Yeah, actually, it's a very good point. And you need to know that to have some other heroes in Pfizer, but uh, they didn't become so famous. There are the people that are working in all our injectable and hospital products. We are the largest supplier of injectable products to the world. And uh, suddenly with COVID, we saw that the demand was going for some medicines that were needed in ICUs from 50 to 500 times. Not. And we had to manage this uptick in supply while we had to operate the manufacturing sites under COVID conditions. So very strict, who goes in, who goes out. I'm very proud of what they were able to do because really in the world, we didn't see, with few exceptions here and there that were transial, big issue with ICUs don't have their medicines. They were transial, as I said, but it could have been a disaster. And it was not because of the work that they did. Didn't you have... No, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Didn't you have a problem with uh, a part of the company engaged in such a exciting exercise and then you had the traditional part? Mm -hmm. uh, there must have been a cultural, uh, let's say, tension between the two parts. How did you manage it? I'm trying to tease the others that you, you have now to prove that you have... Uh, um, uh, your moment and uh, you, cancer team, you saw what the vaccines team did. So now is your time to sign. 
bring us the cure, not only the... So, and uh, um, they do. I, I, actually, w vaccines was one of the six business units of Pfizer, and the other five were watching them, doing their thing, and they were also wanting to have their moment. And the second one was the infectious disease unit that did the treatment. And I'm sure the others are working on that as well. I have a last question. Time is unfortunately running out and we could certainly continue for a long time. What, if you take all your experience now and uh, you have your many CEOs also sitting in the room, what would be your message to them? Based, based on your leader, personal experience. Personal leader and CEO. I think the, the, the biggest lesson for me was that people they don't know what they can and cannot do in their lives. Mm -hmm. And if you set the bar high, if you give them very high ambitious goals and trust in the resources, you will be surprised how much they deliver. Now, I add a question. And the question is, you must have had some doubts yourself because uh, so there was such an expectation level of the public and it could have gone wrong with uh, some uh, setbacks or some bad cases and so on. How did you manage yourself this tension over s such a long time? Uh, it was tension for all and uh, for me. And uh, the, the truth is that the CEO is in a lonely position because there is no one to stop you if you make a mistake. So, which means that buck stops with you there and you are responsible for everything, right? Uh, but um, I felt that what really made me drive is we don't have any option here. What is the option? Not to do it and then what? Have the world uh, die? I mean, if Pfizer wouldn't engage full speed in something like that yeah. with all hands on deck when the world was needing something like that, who would do it? Right? So, it was very clear. That's what uh, we have to do. And that uh, keeps you dry. When, when you understand that this is what is at stake, you, you understand that if you lose three billions, it will be painful, but it's not going to be the end of the world. But if we don't find the solution, yeah. it's going to be very painful for all. Thank you. And re when we applaud you, I think we do it for two reasons. First, uh, it was very evident your social um, responsibility, your sense for purpose. Um, and second, thank you for having so openly shared with you, with us, uh, your, uh, let's say, objectives and also your concerns and what drives you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you.